today's video, we're going to be talking about formal charge, nucleophile electrophile, or otherwise known as acid base reactions, and resonance structures. First, let's talk about formal charge. Formal charge is the actual charge on an atom. We can use it to help predict the most correct structure of a compound, and it can be found per atom in a compound or for the entire compound to find the overall net charge. You might see a couple different equations online for calculating formal charge. The one that I like to use to find the formal charge per atom in a compound is formal charge equals number of valence electrons minus the number of bonds minus the number of lone electrons. So let's take a look at the first example and I'll show you how to apply this equation. If we want to find the formal charge of carbon, the first thing we will do is write out the number of valence electrons. Carbon has four valence electrons as per the periodic table. Then we subtract the number of bonds that it's making. Carbon has one bond to hydrogen here and three bonds to nitrogen, so we subtract four minus the number of lone electrons around carbon. A lone electron would look something like this, just two electrons sitting on the atom. We don't have any lone electrons on carbon, so we subtract zero. That means the overall formal charge on carbon is a zero. Next, let's look at the formal charge of nitrogen. Nitrogen from the periodic table should have five valence electrons. Now we subtract the number of bonds that it's making, three bonds to carbon and one bond to hydrogen, minus the number of lone electrons that we see around it, which are none, which gives us a positive one. The formal charge on nitrogen should be a positive one, and we can just write positive. The formal charges of hydrogens are usually zero, but let's take a look here. Hydrogens have one valence electron, minus the number of bonds that this hydrogen is making is just one to the nitrogen, minus the number of lone pairs that are around this hydrogen are zero. So this hydrogen has a formal charge of zero. Hydrogen has one valence electron, minus the number of bonds it's making is one bond to carbon, minus zero lone electrons gives you a zero formal charge for this hydrogen. So the overall formal charge on this shape is zero for hydrogen, carbon, and hydrogen, and a one for the nitrogen. So the overall formal charge is just a one. Next, let's take a look at this shape. These hydrogens are going to have a formal charge of zero calculated the same way that I did for the shapes above. Let's look at the formal charge of the nitrogen first. Nitrogen should have five valence electrons for the periodic table. Subtract these two bonds that it's making to carbon, subtract four lone electrons that we see, gives us a negative one. For carbon, it should have four valence electrons from the periodic table, minus these four bonds that it's making, two to nitrogen and one to each hydrogen, minus zero lone electrons that we see around it, gives us a zero. These hydrogen's formal charges are also both zero. So nitrogen has a charge of negative one, and the overall charge of the shape should be negative one which is found by summing up the formal charges of each atom in the compound. Next, let's take a look at nucleophile-electrophile reactions. Before we get into doing the reactions, we need to know what nucleophiles and electrophiles are. There are three main characteristics that I use to define these terms. The first one is charge. Nucleophiles are usually negatively charged, and electrophiles are usually positively charged. We just talked about formal charge. So now, when you see a negative or you see a positive, on the shape, this usually refers to the formal charge of the shape. Next is electrons. Nucleophiles are electron rich. They have more electrons around them than they usually need, causing their formal charge to become negative. On the other hand, electrophiles are electron poor, and they usually have empty orbitals, causing them to have a positive formal charge. The last characteristic is that nucleophiles are usually considered bases and electrophiles are usually considered acids. When you come across acid base or nucleophile electrophile reactions, you need to be able to identify which shape is your nucleophile and which shape is your electrophile, because the nucleophile will always attack the electrophile. And if you don't know which is which, you won't know which way to draw your arrows. Let's look at this example. First, we need to determine which shape is the nucleophile and which is the electrophile. Recall the characteristics that we just talked about. Looking at these compounds, I can see a positive charge on this shape. And recall that electrophiles are usually the ones that are positively charged. So this is our electrophile. Now looking at this shape, you can see an extra set of electrons and you see a negative charge. Usually, nucleophiles are electron rich and have extra sets of electrons to use for attacking the electrophile. Nucleophiles are also usually negatively charged. So now that we've determined which compounds are the nucleophile and electrophile, 
let's actually do the reaction. It's usually going to be a pair of electrons on the nucleophile that attack the atom that has the positive attached to it. So you don't attack the positive charge directly, you attack the atom that has the positive empty orbital. So these electrons are going to come and attack our carbon. Note that you should always move a pair of electrons, not just one electron. Now this attacking arrow acts as a bond between the carbon that had the electrons to attack and the carbon that had the empty orbital or the positive charge. A bond will form between these two carbons and we end up getting this shape. Note that this purple bond is this bond that we just created and this would be our answer to the nucleophile electrophile reaction of these compounds. Let's try another example. For this example, Again, the first thing we need to do is determine the electrophile and the nucleophile. Because we're not given any formal charges on the shapes, the next thing I would do is look at which compound has electrons to give away. And it looks like this one does. So this is going to be our nucleophile and the other shape is going to be our electrophile. Now remember that the nucleophile always attacks the electrophile. I did mention earlier that we should always attack the atom that has the positive charge or the empty orbital, but because there is no charge given here, we should attack the central atom. BF3 looks something like this, and the central atom is B, boron. So we are going to take one pair of electrons and attack our boron. Recall that this attacking arrow actually creates a bond between the oxygen and the boron. So we end up getting this, where the oxygen and the boron now have a bond between them. We also need to recalculate the formal charges of the two elements that now formed a bond between them. Oxygen should have six valence electrons as per the periodic table, minus these three bonds that it's making, minus these two lone electrons that you see here, gives you a positive one. Boron should have three electrons as per the periodic table, minus the three fluorines and one oxygen it's bonded to, so four bonds, minus zero lone pairs gives you a negative one. So this oxygen is positively charged and the boron is negatively charged. I usually only check the formal charge of the atoms that actually interacted with one another during the reaction. However, if we do want to check the formal charge of this carbon here, carbon should have four valence electrons and it's making three bonds to hydrogen, which can also be written as this, if it's easier for you to see. And then it would be making one bond to oxygen, so that's four bonds minus zero lone pairs gives you a zero formal charge on this carbon. This carbon has the same thing going on, would also have a zero formal charge. All of the hydrogens would also have a zero formal charge. As I talked about earlier with formal charge, hydrogens are usually zero. And let's look at all of these fluorines. Let's look at this fluorine. Fluorine usually has seven valence electrons and it's making one bond to boron, so minus one. Now we're going to subtract six because this fluorine actually has six electrons around its element, which are not shown in this picture. Each fluorine does have these six electrons around them. Now we know this because before we reacted these two compounds, we were not given any charges on our shape. That meant that our compounds must have been neutral. In order for fluorine to be neutral, it must have had seven total electrons and bonds around it. Now it's already making one bond to boron, each fluorine is. So that means the other six things around its element must have been electrons. So each of these fluorines, each carbon and each hydrogen all have formal charges of zero. Let's try this example next. The first thing we do is look at which shape can act as a nucleophile and which can act as the electrophile. Mm -hmm. We know that HCl, hydrochloric acid, is an acid. Recall that usually acids are electrophiles, so I'm going to label this as the electrophile. This also makes sense because this compound here has electrons to give away, and that's usually what characterizes nucleophiles. Now we know that the nucleophile always attacks the electrophile, and in each of these examples that we covered, the nucleophile has been attacking different parts of our shape. How do we know where the nucleophile actually attacks? So there are a couple different scenarios to know where our nucleophile is going to attack in the electrophile. First, it can attack on the atom that has a positive charge, or it can attack on an end hydrogen, and it can also attack on the central atom. 
as it did with boron in BF3. In this case, we are going to be attacking the end hydrogen. Remember, it is always a lone pair of electrons on the nucleophile that attacks, and it comes and grabs this lone hydrogen. Now, usually what happens in the cases when we attack an end hydrogen is that the electrons in the hydrogen chlorine bond will actually jump onto chlorine because the entire HCl shape does not want to attach onto the oxygen, it just wants to grab the hydrogen. So the electrons in the hydrogen chlorine bond will break apart and go to chlorine. This is called heterolytic bond cleavage, when the electrons in a bond jump onto one of the atoms and break the bond. Now remember that this attacking arrow, as I called it earlier, acts as the bond between atom that does the attacking, which is the oxygen or the electrons on the oxygen, and the atom that it grabs, which is the hydrogen. So I'm going to draw our shape down here. This lone pair of electrons is still here. However, this lone pair of electrons is now going to be inside the bond between oxygen to hydrogen. So this is what our shape is going to look like, with this bond between oxygen and hydrogen containing the electrons that were used to attack. We can also write it like this. So these three examples where the nucleophile attacks on different spots on the electrophile covers the majority of the different types of nucleophile electrophile reactions you will see. I forgot to mention that the chlorine that got kicked off earlier gained these two electrons from the hydrogen chlorine bond. It already had six electrons around it and it gained two more to make a full octet. Now chlorine usually has seven electrons around it in the periodic table, but because it has eight, it has this negative formal charge on it. This would be the side product that's formed along with the main product that I just drew on the previous page. Resonance structures are those which have the same chemical interaction between atoms in the compound. However, the electron distribution is different. One compound can have several different resonance structures and there is usually one best structure that we can choose based on our resonance rules. These rules are as follows. Resonance structures must have the same overall formal charge and electrons are the only things that are moving. You can move electrons from bonds to atoms, atom to atom, or bond to bond. Let's look at an example. Let's look at an example of making a resonance structure from this shape. The first thing we see is that there are lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen. Therefore, we can move these electrons to a different location to make a resonance structure. I'm going to move them onto this bond between oxygen and carbon. Usually we don't take electron pairs and jump them across the shape, so it would not be common for me to just take them and move them down here. The resulting shape would be this. Oxygen still has its lone pair of electrons. It has the bond that it already had with carbon, but now with an added bond with these electrons that we moved, everything else is the same. Now let's check that the formal charges of these structures are the same. And if they are, then that means we have a resonance structure because all of the atoms are still bonded in the same way. However, these electrons are now moved into this bond. We just did atom to bond electron movement. Well, let's look at the formal charge of everything in our compound. Hydrogens are going to be zero. They usually always are. Let's just look at the carbon and the oxygen. Carbon should have four valence electrons around it, minus the three bonds that it's making, minus zero lone pairs, gives us a positive one charge on the carbon. Oxygen should have six valence electrons, minus the two bonds that it's making, minus the four lone pairs, also gives us a zero. That means that every compound has a formal charge of zero except carbon, which is positive one. So if we add up all of the formal charges on our atoms, we get a positive one for the net overall formal charge of this shape. Now let's look at this compound. Again, the hydrogens are going to be zero, but let's look at this carbon. Now carbon usually has four valence electrons minus these four bonds that it's making, double bond to oxygen and two bonds to hydrogen. It has no lone electrons around it, so the overall formal charge is zero. Now let's look at this oxygen. Oxygen usually has six valence electrons around it, minus these three bonds that it's making, two to carbon, one to hydrogen, minus these two electrons, will give us a positive one. So carbon and hydrogens all have a formal charge of zero, and the oxygen has a positive one. If we add together the formal charges of all the atoms in this shape, 
we end up just getting positive 1 from the oxygen. So because the overall formal charges of these shapes are the same, these are resonance structures. Now let's look at the rules in selecting the best resonance structure. In this example, we only have two different structures. However, one compound can have many different resonance structures. We need to set some rules in order to determine the most correct structure. Looking at these two structures from earlier, let's go through the rules in order to determine which one would be the most correct structure. The first rule is that any negative charge should go to the most electronegative atom. We don't have any negative charges in our shape, so we can ignore that rule. If we did, though, the most electronegative atom in this compound is oxygen, so we would try to move all of our negative charges onto oxygen. The next rule says that carbon should not have a charge. In this case, we have a positive charge on the carbon, and down here, we have a positive charge on our oxygen. By this rule, it would tell us that this is not the best resonance structure because there's a charge on our carbon. Although we only have one charge here, sometimes we can have multiple charges on multiple different atoms. The third rule means that we want to have the least amount of charge distribution as possible. If we had a negative charge on carbon and a positive charge on oxygen and somehow a positive charge on this hydrogen, and in the picture up here we only had this positive charge on carbon, and the overall formal charge of this shape is, is positive 1 plus positive 1 minus 1 to just be a positive 1. Now this shape up here also has an overall charge of positive 1. So if these were resonance structures, this one would actually be the best structure because of its charge distribution, where these three charges are consolidated into just one charge. So in our case, rule number 2 is what applies to this question. The best resonance structure is going to be this one because our positive charge is on the oxygen. Let's do one more example for finding the resonance structures of a compound and determining the most correct structure. So given this compound, let's find its other resonance structures. So we draw this arrow which signifies resonance structure. First, let's calculate the overall formal charge of this shape so we know what formal charge we need or resonance structures to have. So adding up the charges we're given, we have one positive and one negative, which is overall zero. So the overall formal charge of this shape is zero. Now the first thing that I'm going to try doing is I see some lone electrons here. I'm going to try moving them into this adjacent bond. First place I start with is always the location that seems to have more electrons or has a negative charge, which means I can move things away from that location. Now what happens when I do that is that this pair of electrons is now inside this bond. Now let's check the formal charge of this oxygen. Oxygen should always have six valence electrons around it, minus the two bonds it's making, minus these four lone electrons will give me a formal charge of zero. Carbon should have four bonds around it, minus the five that it's making right now, two to carbon, two to oxygen, and one to hydrogen, minus zero lone electrons around it, gives me a negative one. Now let's look at the overall formal charge. Negative one from this carbon and positive one from that carbon gives me an overall charge of zero. So this is a resonance structure of this compound. Let's make one more. Now if I look at the electrons in this double bond, I can decide to move them onto this carbon-carbon bond because there's a positive charge, which means there's an empty orbital on this carbon and that it's looking to be filled. Now this is what the shape is going to look like once I move the electrons in this double bond over to this bond. Now let's recalculate the formal charges between these carbons and this carbon. For this carbon here, we have four, because carbon always has four valence electrons, minus four bonds that it's making, minus zero lone electrons equals a formal charge of zero. For this carbon, we have four, minus four bonds that it's making, minus zero lone pairs, equals zero. And for this carbon, we have four minus two bonds to hydrogen and two bonds to this carbon, so four bonds, minus zero lone pairs equals zero. So the overall charge of this shape is zero, which means it is also a resonance structure. So now that we have three resonance structures, we need to figure out which one is the best. 
Well, let's look back at our rules. The first rule states that the negative charge should be on the more electronegative atom. In the first case, we did have a negative charge that was on the oxygen. So according to the first rule, this would be the best structure. Then the second rule states that carbon should not have a charge on it. The second picture and the first picture, we had positive charges and a negative charge here on our carbon. This positive charge, it looks like it's on the hydrogen, but it's actually on the carbon. Um, hydrogen usually doesn't have a charge. So in both scenarios, carbon had either a positive or a negative or both charges. The third picture is the only one that doesn't have any charges on the carbon. And if you look at the third rule, it says that less distribution of charges is better. Meaning, if we look at our first picture, we had a negative on the oxygen and a positive on the carbon. In our second picture, we had a negative on the carbon and a positive on the carbon. And in our third picture, we have no charges. So our third resonance structure is the best one because there are no charges distributed among the shape. So I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, and I will leave a link in the description to the blog post related to this video. Bye for now.